You are listening to the Religica Theo Lab podcast in the Center for Ecumenical and Interreligious Engagement at Seattle University. This is Michael Reed Trice with Religica. In cooperation with the United Nations Environmental Program, Faith for Earth Initiative, and the Center for Religious Wisdom and World Affairs at STM Seattle University. Today I'm speaking with Professor John Grimm, who is a senior lecturer and research scholar at Yale in the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, the Divinity School, and the Department of Religious Studies. Dr. Grimm also co directs the very popular Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. And today, this podcast is a story of leaning into the wind, of our love of place, and whether we have the moral courage to remember the meadow. You'll see what I mean. Take a listen. In the largest city in North Dakota, Fargo, North Dakota, which was about that time 40,000 or so, I could walk to the outskirts from my house in 10 minutes, leaning on my heels into the wind. And that feeling of leaning against the wind has been with me much of my life. I jokingly say it blew me out east to study with Thomas Berry, but the feeling of place, which we'll talk about later, is connected for me. I still orient myself north, south, east, west by places in North Dakota in my imagination. So that part of the world is rides with me even during the years in urban life in New York and in travels and to the present situation teaching in Yale, my connections to in my roots to my family. This image of being blown out into the world in so many ways evident in your story, in the stories of religious and spiritual traditions where whole communities also find themselves displaced and replaced or reconfigured, I should say, in a new way. You studied with Professor Barry, Thomas Barry, the inestimable, so insightful and prolific scholar in his work, who was your friend and teacher and mentor. And I imagine knowing the work that you've done has been, as you've just attested, a guide to so much of your professional and personal life. In his booklet, The New Story, he discusses the Black Death and how we understand the plague in a medieval era. And and here we are again in a new pandemic age. How would Dr. Barry believe, what do you believe, are the kinds of new stories that need to kind of blow us out into the world again for a shared future? Yes, that essay in 1978, New Story essay, it's a culmination of his thinking from the early, late 60s, early 70s. And Thomas came to an understanding of new story. And before I go specifically to his intention by using the word new story, to focus on one part of it that you've drawn out here, namely his focus on the Black Death in the 15th century, if I'm remembering it correctly, 1400s, when so many people in Europe died. And that sense of pandemic that people had no clear understanding of what had caused the epidemic, the Black Death, plague, take so many lives. And as a cultural historian, Thomas Berry, he focused on that event as a way of understanding a transition that he felt occurred from a larger creation-oriented understanding in the medieval Christian context towards redemption out of the world, that if the plague had taken so many lives and if the divine instrumentality had was changed, if we might say, from a providence to an instrumentality, had taken so many lives, people must have asked themselves, what happened? What did we do wrong? And so Barry interpreted that as a profound paradigm shift moment in religious consciousness from a larger cosmological creation-oriented understanding of religion to a much more exclusively redemptive, personal, salvific orientation in the church. 
I sense the direction that Thomas took from his insights into that story was a recovery of creation-oriented religiosity, but obviously it couldn't be recovered in the old cosmology. And hence, this brought him to his sense of a new story that we needed, and he's leaning very heavily on Teilhard de Chardin, but not only on Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, on a larger body of understanding from the science community that the nature of reality was opening us to just incredible insights, and he would even call it wisdom insights in the science community, about the nature of reality. And that sense then of a new creation orientation is Thomas's perspective and new story. But also underlying that, Michael, I feel there's three points that he developed in terms of understanding the cosmos. So he would call them at times cosmological principles or his understanding of what the cosmos is telling us as it speaks to us. But they were differentiation, subjectivity, and communion. I think those are powerful insights that he saw And this has transmitted itself to Mary Evelyn and myself in rather significant ways when Thomas titled this essay, The New Story. And when we consider his first principle of differentiation, we realize that there's a problem in using the article, The. The sense of the differentiated character of the cosmos. From the very beginning, it's marked by this striking differentiation. It's not just one galaxy, or it's not even just one era, the radiant era of matter, but the transition into particles and the movement of gravity to create all of this incredible difference in the universe reality as we've encountered it, so that the story itself will be told in innumerable ways. What Thomas was after was a new story. And so in our film project, Journey of the Universe, we often refer to this as a telling of a new story or a telling of the story of the universe. So from differentiation to subjectivity, the sense that Thomas transmitted in the universe, everything that manifests itself is telling its story of having come out of the universe. And that wonderful appreciation then of say, of Julian of Norwich holding the acorn in her hand and feeling cosmological presence, that medieval understanding of the presence of the divine in the acorn is suddenly transitioned in Thomas's understanding the subjectivity of such a simple seed as the acorn leading to the oak tree itself that configured in the acorn itself. And there's no indication at all that such a magnificent tree could come from it, but its interior voice, its subjectivity manifests that long journey, genetic information revealing itself. And finally, the communion dimension of the universe, which has become so important now in our work, and I believe in global consciousness now of the ecological reality, the the communion experiences of the voices of reality that tell us of their journey. So Thomas had in his new story essay, this signal cultural historical view of a pandemic that resulted in a separating of the human into a redemptive mode, a separating from the world around us. And his effort was to re-engage that world in a profound way by understanding the story being told by differentiated reality. In terms of differentiation, subjectivity, and communion, there's also, I think, in the work at the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology, a new story that's unfolding or is reflective of the stories that are happening in the world right now. And it's a resource, I think, a very brave and courageous resource of specific opportunities for others to learn, not just knowledge, but a deeper sense of awareness of their own subjectivity, of their communion with and alongside others in the world. And that differentiation is also an essential element although it shouldn't lead to a kind of solipsism where we're simply isolated and marooned in ourselves. We require one another. We require the earth. What do you see as the pivotal role that the forum will play, has certainly played, but what role do you want it to play in the future, especially in the age we're in now? So, wonderful question, Michael. The Forum on Religion and Ecology 
from its beginning, was focused on religious traditions and different religious traditions. And so we brought together scholars and environmental activists associated with a particular religion in these 10 conferences that we undertook at the Center for the Study of World Religions at Harvard. And we had the happy occasion to really reflect with one another. These were closed conferences, and then we would have public forums in the evening to try and give out to an audience what we were uncovering. And so the first implication of this that I see carrying into the present is an infra-religious examination. Within each religious tradition, we use the terms retrieval, reevaluation, and reconstruction to talk about this infra religious examination. So, the retrieval dimension for a tradition to go back and to consider what the scriptural passages, what rituals, what in the commentarial tradition on these activities gives insight into the relationship between individuals and communities within that religion to the natural world. And so I happened to bring along my copy of the Tanakh and the Hebrew scriptures, and I wanted to look at Psalm 8. Obviously, in the Hebrew scriptures in Tanakh are these uh, precious reflections on divine relations and extensive statements on human-human interactions, but very little on human-earth interactions, and yet we find some that are quite striking. And so in Psalm 8, it opens with an affirmation of the majesty of the divine in creating the earth and the heavens, and beginning at verse 4, it says, When I behold your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars that you set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? Mortal man that you have taken note of him, that you have made him little less than divine and adorned him with glory and majesty. You have made him master over your handiwork, laying the world at his feet. I wanted to pick up on this passage in the eighth psalm. Because there is that wonderful recognition of the creative presence of the divine in the world. Let's set the gender reference aside for a moment. We could go on there. But the sense of mastery, which is echoing what uh, Genesis 1st chapter 26 verse is, the sense in the Jewish, Christian, and to some extent in the Islamic tradition also, though less developed, the mastery of the human or the dominion of the human. So in the retrieval project in the Forum on Religion and Ecology, it's evident and possible to see the way in which scholars of uh, Judaism, scholars of Christianity and of Islam have revisited this dominion and mastery passage and have begun to ask questions. What are the terms that are used here? What was what's being said? Is this stewardship? And so there's a whole reevaluation once the retrieval takes place, of understanding what is said within traditions. And finally then, along with retrieval, reevaluation is reconstruction. A feeling that these traditions are able to revisit these practices and to reshape themselves. And in fact, as we look at these traditions, we see that in their historical development. They're constantly adjusting, shaping themselves to respond to the questions of their times. The agenda of the Forum on Religion and Ecology has a specifically religious connection, and yet we have also attempted to speak to those in an a-religious or non-religious setting. So we've tried to be sensitive also to the spiritual dimensions of ecology. And there are many colleagues, Les Sponsel or others, the Society for Religion, Nature, and Culture, who have extensively attended to the spiritual dimension, say, of nature religions or paganism or modes that are not often associated with the mainstream religions. And the Forum has had that type of attention also. We wanted to acknowledge that spirituality is not something unknown to the religious traditions. In fact, the religions of the world are filled with these particular modes of spirituality that get woven then into the institution of the religions themselves.
But as a final comment then, Michael, if the forum is speaking to religious traditions and then also ex- trying to extend that reach, I think it's also evident that we are trying to challenge these traditions also to see, on the one hand, that they have long-standing connections with the natural world. In fact, they are religions of the world instead of simply world religions. And that in many ways, as Thomas Berry was keen to say, the religions of the world, they complete one another. And I think that sense of completion now is the arena or the earth and the context of the earth community itself as we engage with our understanding of the problems within the earth community. The religions have something significant to say, but we have to find realization that we are late to the game. A certain humility is evident in this. In terms of the religions of the world and thinking about how institutions can assist one another, you also have a new relationship. Well, you have an ongoing relationship with the United Nations Environmental Program, in particular the Faith for Earth Initiative. But there's also a new template for that relationship or direction for it at the moment. Could you talk about that as well? We're all aware that the UN in its formation was itself marked by the modern secular consciousness and the emergence of nation states. And without overemphasizing at least, there was evident a distancing from the religious traditions lest the problems of religion be brought into that institution. So the United Nations and the environmental program also, when we first began to work with UNEP, it was receptive to our work. It was seen as problematic in terms of bringing the religions into the United Nations context. That, I find, is a significant change with the work now of the United Nations Environment Program and the the Faith for Earth Initiative at UNEP. That particular relationship that we've established with the Faith for Earth is part also of what we've all seen emerge in this global consciousness, but not simply to reduce this global consciousness to economic or political realities, but there's a deeply spiritual character which I myself prefer planetary consciousness, and that awareness of ourselves as on a unique planet in our solar system, and that life has come forward here, and now we take responsibility, a serious challenge of facing the human as we floresce around this planet. And there's a fear that has grown among some communities that maybe out of this motivation of differentiation, that they will lose their own voice to this planetary consciousness. So you get this imaging of the black helicopters or whatnot coming and taking people's guns away or whatnot. But rather than that kind of extreme or almost silly version of it, the idea of planetary consciousness has to be emphasized in relationship to differentiation, I believe. So that this is really a multi-form or a planetary civilization, a planetary consciousness that values and helps to augment differentiation. That's a, a tremendous challenge to nurture languages, nurture cultural differentiation. Along with that planetary consciousness is planetary health. And that's, I see both of them emerging now in terms of our pandemic containment that we're beginning to be aware of health in ways that are very important for our environmental thinking going forward, that the health of humans is embedded in the health of the planet. We're not sure where COVID-19 has come from, but one of the conjectures is that it's out of human relationships with the animal community. And so that uh, sense of the health of animals, the health of biodiversity, the health of the botanical world, all of that is embedded in planetary health now. So I see this as important work going forward, Michael, and I think it will be extremely creative as the decades progress. Even as we have spoken about the indefinite article for a story, there is something definitive about the moment we're in the kind of pivot moment we're in, and the seriousness for the world, for ourselves, for these religions that has arrived at our door quicker than I think perhaps most people believed it would. There is perhaps a popular sensibility that there's something happening now 
It's very important that we're attentive to it. You mentioned earlier the wisdoms of science and the wisdoms of religion. And we have religious leaders who are really frontline and the vanguard of their fields, of their religious and spiritual traditions, who amidst that seriousness are looking for a vocabulary, a language, in order to describe to the communities around them and even to themselves, what are the kinds of moral and best spiritual practice responses that are essential to the communities that they're leading today? How do you respond to those people? I'm hearing, Michael, in your question, the probing of our understanding of environmental ethics and changes, perhaps, in that ethical relationship on the horizon. Yes, and that isn't out on the periphery, but is about to become existentially essential to how they even communicate every day with their people. Yes. I feel the question rising in the economic concerns that we have now in our pandemic era and our sheltering in place and our containment has given rise to economic issues that are quite frightening for many people. And they tend even to push the health issues into the background. At one point, I remember some weeks back, people saying, we should end containment and bring the economy back as soon as we can. And some people pushed back saying, we would endanger lives, we would endanger human lives. I sense, Michael, your question, when we consider that scenario and we see that discussion is on a human-human level, and I think that is entirely where the history of ethical thought, as it was developed, that's the context, the frame in which it was considered. It was a human interaction with humans And it's a diversion here, but since we have the joy of making diversions, I recall John Cobb, the wonderful theologian, process theologian, process thinker, who we in conversation one day were talking about his early training. And he laughingly said, you know, I took a year long course in natural theology and not once in that course was the word nature mentioned. The whole idea of natural theology was caught up in the capacity of the human to be rational. And so the whole focus was on the rational efforts to understand the divine. I think ethics was caught in the same frame, that the capacity of the human to rationally understand behavior to other humans. And that understanding, I think, now is entirely challenged in our times. And that we begin to see that the concern we have in our thinking here in the, in the containment time is that we return to our relationships with one another with a new understanding of the world that we live in, too. Survival, the food issues, our children and their educational issues, all of these are tied now into our sense of what is this house that we're living in? What is the house that we find ourselves contained in now? And so the sense of the internet or our ability to communicate outside of our personal homes is in alignment with this discovery of the new house that we are, the community that we are. And so phrases like earth community that Thomas Berry used, I think begin to suggest to us that our ethical perspectives, our understandings of our appropriate behavior, what are the deeper moral issues that confront us as we expand our understanding of appropriate behavior out into the earth community? What will it mean for extractive industries? Because we certainly will not diminish or we will not end our extractive activity, but perhaps we will diminish or we will begin to limit in an understanding that if we diminish or limit our human extractive activities, we may augment the flourishing of the earth in certain ways. So I think these are deep challenges, but it's also very exciting to think about the voices that will emerge now as we, well, as we begin to tell our story in its larger, more expansive ways. Yesterday, I mentioned a young Lakota man who was talking about place and spiritual place and a place where liturgical practice had taken place in his community for thousands of years. And he referred to even the smallest roots 
in the blades of grasses in that place as connected to what he termed a spiritual DNA, a deeper sense of DNA in place, which seemed to have been lost, he thought, on many of the religions of the world. And he was making an appeal in this to a kind of indigenous consciousness about place. Why is place so important in your work? And do you think for what might be termed indigenous consciousness, although you might choose to identify that differently? That's such a lovely question, Michael. The feeling for place is a a phrase that I find myself repeating quite a bit. And by feeling, I intend a deep affection. And I feel that affection even when we began Oak of my childhood in North Dakota and the feeling of wind. And I won't claim an indigenous perspective in that regard, but I will claim that the earth is constantly speaking to all of us. And I think that deep yearning to connect with stones, with rocks, to hear the sounds of birds or the call of animals and the wind and the tree, these are are widespread in the human. We find it in the poetry of all of the human cultures on the earth. So that the term indigenous, with all of its problematic ambiguity, you know, who are we referring to, and are we glossing over the names of particular people, and all of these I will acknowledge, and I don't want to go down that road at this moment, but I, I would want to say that in the United Nations in 2007, the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People was passed, and that document very aware the the framers of that document had extensive participation by elders from very particular native groups around the globe. And the use of the word indigenous is problematic in many communities. South Asia, it's not used. Southeast Asia, it's used in the Australian continent, certainly used in the American hemisphere much more extensively. But in the United Nations, and let me make this a final point in this regard, the term indigenous It emphasizes those communities that have been marginalized and oppressed and have lost much of their voice in the colonialist activity. And this term voice, I think, brings me back then to the question that we're dealing with here about place. That my understanding of the way indigenous elders talk about that deep affection for place And sometimes a terrible loneliness that they feel when they see that places have been so radically changed by extractive industries or by pollution and a deep pain that comes from that experience is that the affection from place is connected to ancestors. It's connected to the stories of the people. It's embedded in their language so that even speaking in the Anishinaabe or Lakota or the many languages of the peoples of the globe, that they evoke the consciousness that you were speaking of in your question, namely a blade of grass, a particular plant, an animal that has also walked across or passed over this land. And the recognition, Thomas Berry, I think, also had a feeling that he nurtured in his life, and it was an experience of lilies in a meadow when he was very young. And this experience stayed with him, and I think it was somewhat inchoate. It was not a formed and clear experience, but as he matured, it began to clarify itself with more force. And he would begin to talk about the meadow across the creek as that which shaped an ethical regard in his life. And he would say, I began to realize that a good medical practice would enhance the health of that meadow. A good politics would make sure that that meadow survived. A good education would prepare me to understand what that meadow was about. So seeing the lilies across the field in that meadow, seeing it as a voice that's talking about, talking with the human in relationship and talking about a shared living experience that we're all having rather than just life on one side or the other. So he would come to an understanding, that is, Thomas Berry came to this understanding that humans are not capable of creating a blade of grass. And yet he would say, there's liable not to be a blade of grass unless we foster and nurture the earth community that creates that blade of grass. 
And I sense he comes very close in this moment. Out of this European-American consciousness, he comes very close to what I feel indigenous elders are speaking about, that sense of the voice that is in places. I tend to see place monolithically as a particular geography or a particular location. But I believe indigenous elders, when they see it, they see in place the ecology of place, the fullness of life in the place, the grass, the soil, the animals, the ancestors, all of this embedded in incredible imaginative act, as well as in visual act, an act of elucidating what's there, and this sense of place is a ecology of place. And I think that's so important is voice. That the voices in indigenous perspectives, sovereignty is embedded in the voice of the places. That if you take away the voices in this place, you lose the sovereignty. And that includes human sovereignty. We invested in the nation state, but native people invested in that relationship of the humans with place. When I began my studies in indigenous traditions, I studied a ceremony called the Midewiwin, the sound of the drum, a particular Anishinaabe or Northern Ojibwe ceremonial. I began to see that it was the ceremony of the people in relationship to place. And when I studied other people, I came across a Cheyenne ceremony called Masaum, in which the dancers in this ceremony put on the masks and the, they become the animals and the plants in this place. That's what happens in Midewiwin also. As my studies expanded, I began to realize that many indigenous ceremonials are ceremonies of conversation with a place in which the people make present the animals or the biodiversity, and they literally give the biodiversity voice during the ceremony. And in many of these ceremonies, a political act is involved. The people are asking in this ceremony, in their movement across the land, they have come to this place and they are asking, is it acceptable that we stay in this place? Is it acceptable that we live here? And they look for the answer of the animals and they have continued to celebrate the answer of life in the region has said yes. I think that's what we're about now. Mike. We're trying to find the yes. We're trying to come to some, some really deep feeling and affection in which we feel affirmed from the soles of our feet up to our mental consciousness. I remember reading Aldo Leopold when I was much younger and his reminiscence on when he himself was younger, he could see quail, a certain part of the country, filling the skies. And as he had gotten older, they had disappeared. And now there are no quail of any significance in those skies. But even in his recollection... He was, I think, his cosmology, as I'm hearing you describe this, was very much situated, even for his deep love of nature, I think, place as external. There are trees, and there are birds, and they are associated with one another. But there's something different, something very unique in an indigenous cosmology, if I can say that kind of in a monolingual way for the moment that what we've missed in an extractionist economy, what we've developed an amnesia around, I might say, is our inability to see and hear the voice of embodiment as you've just described it. Am I right in saying that a euphemism for this would be that the gift of place is not limited to, not at all limited to the things around me. There is an embodied voice in place and the tragic aspect of our current situation is that we have become, in many ways, really tone deaf to what it's telling us about itself, about the world, and that we've abused and disassociated ourselves from many of those who are hearing that and whose voices should be respected about what the world is requiring of us today. At working and teaching at a school of the environment at Yale, I'm surrounded by colleagues, many of whom would respond to your question quite readily and deeply and lovingly. 
of their experience of ecological studies as a contemplative act. They may not use that language, and certainly they wonder what a couple of historians of religion like Mary Ellen and myself are doing at the school. But the deep affectivity is shared. And I think they also, they come to something which I think Aldo Leopold was also groping towards. I appreciate the description you've given where his land ethic has a kind of objectification of the world out there. And we, of a knowing scientific mindset, have to be aware of this and manage this place out there. But at moments in his thinking, he used one phrase, such a lovely phrase, thinking like a mountain. And it's so evocative, isn't it? He is obviously trying to imagine something, and this imaginative act is for him an ecological act, the wholeness of the mountain, the life on the mountain, especially deer and wolves, predator-prey relationships, which he would research so much during his life. I would like to take his participial form and to extend it into your question about the gift of the world. And to see that many indigenous elders, say Robin Kimmerer in that lovely book, Braiding Sweetgrass, she goes right to the giving character of the world. So rather than place being an objectified out there, its subjectivity is also not just something we humans in our solipsistic turn in modernity where we reduce everything to our human mind. All of our knowing is simply through categories to use the conscient language, but we're projecting onto the world. But the participial form giving, I think, opens up a rather obvious exchange that the world is giving us the air that we breathe, The world is giving us the nurturing food that we eat, regardless of how we manage or come to even domestic animals. That's still an act of giving on the part of the world through what the animals are eating. And that giving, I think, is central. So whether we would use the noun form gift or the giving act of the world, that giving continues into the present in ways that are remarkably challenging as we explore it with our scientific knowledge and our wisdom traditions from the world's religions also. In my mind now is coming this attention to the human mind or the human capacity to imagine. And I'm struck by the elder who has seen places in the landscape that have been so radically changed that they're no longer even familiar, and as if all the voices are gone. And the deep pain of loss, and yet the imaginative act of what the meadow was, or what the place was. And I'm struck by how our human mind has this incredible capacity to simultaneously hold an incredible number of imaginative entries into place. And it's that place, and drawing again on the indigenous perspectives that I was trying to speak of earlier, that animal in that place, that insect, that plant, the variety of the simultaneity of our capacity of our mind to hold that is what we have been given as humans. To The giving act of the earth in our own imaginative capacities is a seminal characteristic, I think, of the givenness of the world into the human. We have this incredible capacity to hold the world. And how we hold it, I think, is the challenge that we face, whether we will hold it in a loving, affectionate way, or whether we will continue this instrumental usage and feel the world saying to us, as Thomas Berry used to say, you used me. And that feeling of having been objectified or objectifying something else, that that challenges us to feel our ability to hold the world in our imagination and to think with the world, the giving world, and then in our hands, our technologies. It's to extend the giving and the loving capacity that we hold in our mind-brain to bring that back to the earth community, a reciprocal act.
what has been given to us through our technologies. Some people use the word appropriate, even beyond appropriate technologies. We need technologies that flourish the earth community. So rather than abandoning technology, I think we really need to explore what is it that enables us to give back this circular economy, to use that language of mutual giving. When you think about the work of the forum and your scholarship and leadership over the arc of these years, what is it you want people to remember and to know and to do with their lives? Is it to, for instance, be creatively engaged with moral and spiritual imagination that the world requires of them today? Or how would you frame it? I'm caught now in the act of simultaneity. I think that's many things. And fortunately, when we recover a sense of our embeddedness in a cooperative community of subjects, I think we begin to realize it's not necessary for us to do everything. If we do that one thing that nurtures the earth community, I think that's what I would hope that the Forum on Religion and Ecology can communicate that we move from an understanding of world religions where the the religions were evaluated according to some narrow criteria formulated by conquering oppressive peoples. We move to a sense of the religions of the world, that all of us have come out of this world, And that we begin to see that there is something in these other religious traditions that we did not have. They're saying it in ways that is teaching us, and they're completing us just as we're completing them also. I would hope that the Forum on Religion and Ecology can nurture that understanding. It's a peacemaking. It's an act of celebrating what we find in other traditions. I mean, the yogic traditions of South Asia have transmitted themselves around the world. And you find Christians, Jews who practice yoga, and the sense of breath control is not seen as losing one's own tradition, but rather something is completed, something has been brought in. And our journey forward as we go, our journey of the universe forward, as we begin to hear the voices of the earth that's telling us about their journey, as we begin to nurture the earth community, my hope is that the Forum on Religion and Ecology can advance and enhance that meadow across the creek, as Thomas Berry was saying, or the capacity of the wind on the back of a child to be receptive to the push of that wind as something deeply creative and to let that wind carry us forward in peace and loving relationship with one another and with the larger Earth community. You are listening to the Religica Theo Lab podcast in the Center for Ecumenical and Interreligious Engagement at Seattle University. 